What's going on, Bird Gang? This is Darren Sproles here. I just want to thank you all for tuning in to Eagles Brawl of the Brawl Network. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and leave a five-star rating. Fly, Eagles, fly. All right, thanks for tuning in to Eagles Brawl of the Brawl Network. However, you're listening, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you get the podcast. We greatly appreciate it. Co-host Connor Miles here in the house my Eagles insider, Ed Cross. Ed, what an exciting first week of training camp. There's a lot of stuff to go over for a recap. It was actually nice to be out there and watching football again and seeing – uh, you know, some of the guys we talked about all off season long actually put the pads on and go at it. Yeah, I bet. I, I miss it so much. But uh, to start off the show, Andre Dillard, there's some good things. There's some there's some iffy things. Uh, but he added the weight. Has it so far? Cause we're just going to roll right into it. So far, has it shown to you that that added weight has been resulting in extra added strength? Well, he certainly looks bigger. And, you know, I'll say this, you know, when we talked to Andre – uh, during a Zoom call, he certainly looked like a much different type of player. He certainly seemed more confident than he was last year. Uh, last year, he seemed kind of wide-eyed, and he wasn't really sure what was going on. This year, he really seems confident. He knows the job is his, um, and he does look bigger. He does look stronger now. You know, he's done, like you said, some good and some bad, um, which everybody really has. It's the first week in pads, but, uh, you know, I'm encouraged by Dillard. I think that uh, he's in a good place right now weight-wise, uh, mental wise uh and i think that the eagles are, are pretty happy with what he's done so far that's a good thing because uh no matter what if he fails or he doesn't look good jason peters is always on or looking over his shoulders so mm-hmm. uh that's that's a good thing to hear about andre diller but uh that'd be the best case scenario obviously for the eagles is he pans out and he plays well this year and they just move forward with him continuing a left tackle so mm-hmm. that's good to hear and then jjr sega white sides making some noise uh, those two acrobatic catches, I think, believe, to end the practice yesterday. Everybody was hyping up. Uh, and then he's back with the first team ever since. I think he missed, what, the first practice, and then ever since he's been back. Uh, and he's been taking first team reps. So what are your thoughts on him right now? Yeah, he, during Friday's scrimmage, he really looked uh, – he looked good. Uh, he made – the offense actually scored on the first drive that they came out on the field in 11-on-11. 11 11. It was a, a 75-yard drive that Wentz engineered, and – uh, J.J. made three catches on that drive. The first one was on a, a kind of a deep out pattern right in front of us. We had a very good vantage point uh, as a reporter sitting in the bleachers at Novacare right behind where the defense was, and the, the out was ran right towards us, and he really laid out uh, and made a nice diving catch. Now, Av- Avante Maddox was griping that he, you know, he was pushed. He got pushed off. I didn't see it, but um, I might have had my, been looking elsewhere at the time, and then when I saw uh, J.J. make his cut towards us, I looked. I didn't see him push off. Avante clearly thought he did, but they let the play stand. And it, regardless of whether he pushed off or not, it was a great catch. And then his second catch in that series was kind of a deep throw, uh, maybe about 20 yards or so down the left side of the field. Uh, he had to kind of go up between two defenders, and he made a great catch, and it was right near the sideline, and he got both his feet in, uh, and it was called a completion by the official that was working the camp. And um, – you know, he got up and he flexed a little bit and he, you know, did the first down point, you know, uh, to indicate a first down. So, you know, that's something you wouldn't have seen from him last year. So I think he's getting a little bit more, uh, you know, in tune with things. Uh, we had him on a Zoom call earlier uh, the, during the week and uh, he talked about some of his struggles. He was very candid about his struggles. Mm-hmm. Uh, And it seemed to me it wasn't so much the injury issue that, you know, Howie Roseman sort of revealed he had when he was drafted, although he did say it's the first time he had ever had an injury uh, linger more than two weeks going back through high school and college. But what it seemed to what he seemed to indicate was it was information overload. Uh, He didn't quite know what he was doing. He always had to come to practice with a script in his hand. He was always thinking about where he needed to be and what he needed to do. Um, which was kind of surprising coming from a guy that went to Stanford, but 
you know, I guess everybody kind of adjusts differently with this stuff, but he says he feels more comfortable with that now. And then his third catch in that drive was kind of an out pattern. I think it was on a third down throw that went for six or seven yards. It was a big catch uh, after Wentz rolled right. Uh, And I will say this, Connor, that Wentz seems to be rolling a little bit more to his left and right. They're getting him out of the pocket a little more. They need to. I think that's important. I think especially the offensive line this year because yeah. we, it's really a different whole unit this year. But uh, JJ Arcega Whiteside, uh, as a guy that's always been so critical of him my, as myself, seems more confident. Seems like a different player right now. I, I'm just getting that from the Zoom meetings, of course, and then these catches are are great. But to to get up and flex and do the first down, like yeah. that, he needs that momentum. Anybody needs that type of confidence. It's him. So to hear that, and then only that. If Wentz is rolling out and J.J. Arcega Whiteside is the guy that's getting open, that's good news because that wasn't happening at all last year. Does he look like a lot more fluid running routes? Uh, he looks more precise. Yeah, that out pattern I mentioned, now maybe he pushed off. Like I said, I don't know. But that out pattern certainly was precise, and he was able to get open enough that Wentz threw it up to him, and he was able to come down with it you know, 20 yards down the field. So, you know, you just hope that that confidence doesn't wane if things don't go right or if he drops a pass. Um, that's the problem with some of these rookies, Connor, that come into the league is they, whether they'll admit it or not, they question whether or not they belong. And I think JJ was in that place last year was he wasn't sure, quite sure he belonged, uh, in the NFL. And I think it's still kind of a feeling out process. Um, but it's certainly encouraging with, uh, how he's responded after the first week that we've been able to see him. I will admit as harsh as I have been on him and as the Philadelphia fan base is on him, that transition from the PAC 12 being, a especially at Sanford weird offense with David Shaw and they really were hindered. They really rely on Bryce love and then Bryce love gets injured. And that's when JJ really started to hit his stride, but it was still like a jump ball type offense. And then in a conference that doesn't play any press coverage at all, really tough transition. Cause if you're a jump by jump ball guy in the NFL, you're playing press coverage. And obviously that's where his struggles came from last year, but uh, I'm excited. I mean, that, that's exciting news to hear that he's a lot more confident. I mean, the Eagles are relying on him going forward. So, and I mean, he's taking first team reps. So you have to think that maybe there, there are hopes for him this season is to line up at X. Well, he talked about his off season workout program too. You know, he worked out seven hours a day. He said first he took some time off to kind of, you know, recharge mentally. And then he got right back at it. Seven hour work days. He worked out with a track coach. He said he got faster. Um, he bought a jugs machine, so he, he caught the ball every day. Uh, he worked out in a swimming pool, uh, seven hours of conditioning and weight training. And he said he lost seven or eight pounds. He said he, he's eight pounds lighter than when he came into camp last year. He said he came into camp a little bit heavy last year, so he's a little bit lighter. He thinks he's a little bit quicker and faster. I haven't seen him really run, um, you know, and run away from anybody during the week, but, uh, he says he's faster, so you know we're, we're going to see. Because, like you said, he's always able to use his body well in jump ball situations in the Pac-12. But in the NFL, it's all about separation, and you have to be able to get some of that. Absolutely, that's absolutely correct. But I mean, hey, the Eagles are dead. if he plan- ends up panning out being the X, then you have Jalen Rager as your Z. These young guys, Watkins, Hightower coming in, they could be the slaughter. Greg Ward. That's all cheap wide receiver contracts for the Eagles going forward. That's huge if they want to pay Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard. So, I yep. I, I mean, the best case scenario is obviously pans out. If not, they have to go into 2021 and replace them. But uh, that's good news. It's good news. To hear. I know it's only the first week. It's only training camp. So, we want to take everything with a grain of salt. But, I mean, uh, for a guy that visibly wore his emotions on his face when he was failing last year to go into camp, make these great catches, flex – do the first down. Even if he pushed off, man, you know, in the NFL, the guys get away with that crap all the time. He's, he's going to get some. He's going to get flagged for some. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. But to have that confidence to get up and do the first down and everything like that, to talk to you guys, and then the Philadelphia media, we all know how how tough this market is in media-wise. To go in front of you guys and admit, hey, you know, I sucked last year. <laughs> like, yeah. to be that open, yeah. uh, I'm encouraged. I am encouraged to see this guy. He looks like he's going to improve. I definitely believe he'll obviously improve off of last year, but he looks like – He's getting a little more more adjusted to the NFL and uh, fitting better, and hopefully he does know this the system better, the routes that he needs to do. Because I think in this certain offense now, with Nelson Aguilar gone and Jordan Matthews being long gone, they have to start moving wide receivers all around. They can't pigeonhole a guy into one spot. So uh, I would like to see JJ maybe take advantage of some slot opportunities this year, going up against like some, some smaller slot corners, and then have like Rager at X and Deshaun at Z or. 
you know, all these type of different formations that the Eagles could probably do. I don't want to like just limit JJ to the X and that's all you can do. I want to be able to move him, move him around a lot. I'm sure Doug Peterson does too. So uh, good to hear that his confidence is picking up and uh, good to hear that he looks a little more fluid. So I'm, I'm a little excited to see what JJ does in year two. I am excited. Uh, yeah. I hope he does pan out. I mean, obviously that's the best long-term situation for the Eagles, but uh, Nicole Roby Coleman is, is looking the part so far as from what I'm hearing. Uh, Mike K said he was the best corner so far on the Eagles uh, during his first week of camp. How much of a challenge do you think, though, that this secondary faces with chemistry, creating chemistry? Because then you heard about John Hightower uh, taking advantage of that long touchdown because there's a blown coverage by Jalen Mills where Darius Slade thought Jalen Mills is going to pick it up. Do you think that that's going to be a big – first, I want to obviously hear about Nicole Ruby Colbin, how you think he's doing. And then, second, do you think this chemistry is going to take a little bit? Because it's interesting to me to see that the Eagles are – because we all, you talked about it multiple times. Everybody talked about it. This cornerback two competition is kind of fake. Avante Maddox is a starter, but you're you're looking to see that the Eagles are really sticking with putting Maddox at the first team reps and Jalen Mills at safety in the first team reps. So they're already trying to create this chemistry. Whereas it doesn't really seem like there's that much competition going on. Will Parks is probably going to be the third safety. Jalen Mills is probably going to start. Maddox is going to start. It looks like the Eagles are sticking to more towards that because of no preseason and this unordered off ox season because they know that these guys are going to pick up chemistry. Uh, so what do you think about that? Do you think it's going to take some time? Well, to answer your first question about Nikel Roby Coleman, I think uh, one play I, I will say that it really flashed on for me was um, during seven on sevens, uh, a throw down the field uh, to Deshaun Jackson. And he was right in step with Deshaun Jackson. It's not an easy thing to do. And uh, he had to get up to get the ball. It was a nice ball, but uh, Nikel Roby Coleman made a really nice. He leapt up, he, and he was able to knock it down. And, you know, if you can cover Deshaun Jackson like that, um, I don't you know. anyone. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. You right. can't that, cover. That's encouraging for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he he's looked good. And he's not going to be just pigeonholed, I don't think, in the slot. I think, you know, Jim Schwartz is going to mix his cornerbacks inside, outside. I think you'll see Slay. Uh, get in the slot at some point just to kind of disguise some coverages. Um, but they have some good interchangeable pieces here. Uh, I will say about Maddox, I haven't been that uh, impressed by Avante Maddox so far. I think, you know, he's given up some plays. He gave up a play, uh, a, re- a reception to Robert Davis, where Davis was ca- able to outleap Maddox. And if if you can't get any, you know, uh, jumping, if you can't get a better jump, than what Maddox gave on that play at five foot nine, he's going to get beaten over the top, or he's going to lose these jump ball situations. But um, I haven't really seen a whole lot that I like from Maddox so far uh, this week. It's only been a week. Um, I'm sure he's done some good things, but right now there's probably a little bit more bad things that I've seen that kind of stand out to me. Um, so that that's a little bit of concern. And then you mentioned the chemistry and how long will it take to get these parts together. You know, they have a new defensive backs coach and Mark Juan Manuel, who, uh, you know, he used to play this game. The players really respect that. Um, and it's going to be up to him to make sure that these these pieces do kind of come together in symphony uh, when the when the curtain goes up on the season and that they're able to play uh, together and cohesive. Uh, I think it could take a little bit of time. Um, I really like Slay. Everybody's talked highly of Slay and how he has come in and he's able, he wants other people to get better. So he's imparting what he knows to the defensive backs. He's even talking to the young uh, rookie receivers. Quez Watkins mentioned him uh, after practice yesterday on Friday uh, that Slay tells him like, okay, this is what you need to do to beat me uh, and to beat other cornerbacks, which is awesome for a cornerback to come in and, and share what he knows um, I, but I think it will take a little bit of time with Will Parks and, you know, Rodney McLeod on the, on the far back end. And of course, Jalen Mills, um, you know, new to the safety spot. I think it's going to take a little bit of time, but you know, what? 31 other teams are in the same boat as the Eagles and there's going to be positions that are going to need time to gel. Uh, and I think this cornerback secondary group for the Eagles is going to be one of them, but I think eventually they'll figure it out. I mean, I like the talent that they have, uh, at that position. Absolutely. I, I think it's going to take some time, but I mean, that they have the talent to figure it out, though. Absolutely. Uh, the thing I think that really we're not talking about enough about the Darius Slay impact on those wide receivers is these wide receivers, since Doug Peterson started in 2016, have not faced top tier cornerback talent when they're go- going up in practice like that. I think Slay being that guy that is going to be the proven cornerback one. I know a lot of people are overhyping these uh 
these videos of Deshaun Jackson beating him on a free release and then John Hightower making them uh, break his cleats in. But, I mean, those drills are for the wide receiver to win anyways. I, I don't read that much into it. I'm glad that you're already saying Slay looks great. But uh, it's, to it's me, Maddox. I think – Maddox a concern. You know, Maddox to me yeah. on the other side right now uh, is a little bit of a concern for me. Well, I agree with what your point was because Jim Schwartz said it himself uh, there at his presser, and then you said it too in your notes and your practice notes on – by the way, you guys should all read the Ed's practice notes on Sports Illustrated Eagles page. They're really good and really informative. Um, but you said it from Jim Schwartz's presser that they're talking about moving uh, – the core will be coming outside in certain matchup advantages. Will Parks played amazing in the slot last year. Jalen Mills can play the slot. I mean, not something that I ideally want, but he can – and then uh, Maddox obviously played a slot, but also came on Wallace. Yeah. That was one of his best traits that Clemson was playing in the slot. So they have all these – you're right. They have all these pieces they could move around. Mm-hmm. And then Cravon LeBlanc, I mean, he's still there. And I think every time he gets on the field, he does something good. I, I, I just think the Eagles don't really trust his health or anything. But, I mean, yeah. once he's on the field, he's he's solid. A uh, little disappointed mm-hmm. to hear about Maddox, but, I mean, the guys yeah. behind him aren't really – it's not like – He's going to be handed that job, to be honest with you. There's no way Jim Schwartz is going to trust Eddie Jones and Rizul Douglas. I think I don't. I don't really think he makes the team. Ed, I think they. I think they fixed his deal for a reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would. I probably with you there. I think you know. I've seen him get beat a couple times uh, in one-on-one drills where Mark and Manuel has really kind of gone over to him and talked to him, and uh, you can see they're trying to coach him up. But I'm just not sure. We talked about confidence earlier. I'm not sure where his confidence level is. Uh, you know, with all these new parts they brought in, I think, you know, it's only natural to think, you know what, I, the handwriting's on the wall here and um, maybe he's not rising to meet that challenge. So I, I agree. I think he'll have a very hard time uh, making this roster. But let me, you know, backtrack here to Wallace and Parks. I thought they really looked good in Friday's scrimmage. I mean, Wallace came up and made a really nice tackle on Elijah Holyfield, who, by the way, looks really good at running back. Mm-hmm. Um but right near the sideline, he came up and lowered his helmet. And boy, it was a real collision, right? Again, right in front of us. And, you know, you could just hear the pop. And both guys got up. Wallace hopped up, and the defensive sideline was going nuts for the big hit. It was really cool to see. And then Parks made a great tackle behind the line on, uh, I think it was Holyfield after he caught a short throw. Parks came racing up. And as soon as Holyfield turned, Parks was on him and, and popped him uh, for about a three yard loss. So, I mean, I, I think those guys look really good and that's really something, uh, to be encouraged by. Right. I think there's no way those guys, I mean, obviously we'll partially see the field a lot this year, but I mean, I think Cameron Wallace will too. Uh, yeah. again, they're replacing over a thousand snaps with Malcolm Jenkins. The third safety role played almost 400 snaps. There's, there's going to be a lot of snaps there, uh, to give up to all those guys. I think Jalen Mills probably plays 600 at safety. Will Parks probably 400-ish, maybe 500. And then Kayvon Wallace lining up between slot and the, uh, at safety, you're probably going to look at maybe 200-ish snaps. Yeah. So yeah. I think they're going to find ways to get those guys on the field no matter what. I'm excited for them uh, for yeah. sure. Yeah. But uh, Malik Jackson is also somebody that I'm now really excited for because at the beginning of the offseason, everybody thought, you know, we should just ride out Malik Jackson. He's coming back from IR. We're fine at defensive tackle too. And I thought, no. They might want to look in the draft and draft his replacement because, again, he's coming off the injury. He's aging, and he's also coming off a, a, a downward Jacksonville tenure as well. So to see that he – I mean, obviously the Eagles brought on Javon Hargrave, so they addressed the defensive tackle two position right away. But obviously I think they want to be more a superior interior defensive line team rather than defensive end team because you saw the resources there are pretty much fourth-round draft picks – for death chart purposes and Vinnie Curry. Whereas you have Cox, you have Hargrave, you have Malik Jackson, and you have Hassan Ridgeway, who I thought is actually a really good player too, as your four defensive tackles. So it looks like the the philosophy is build within the interior, let the the young, speed, agile guys, rotational pass rushers live on the outside with all the pressure coming from the interior. So to hear that Malik Jackson's back – fully healthy and turning heads at camp is really great news for me. And it kind of, in my opinion, squanders my worry about this defensive line death because of how much the interior has going forward. What do you think about Malik Jackson so far? Well, he was a terror on Friday. I mean, he had, I think, three sacks in the scrimmage. I mean, he's been very difficult to block. And 
you know, the thing about the offensive and defensive line, even though there's been a lot of thud type practices during the week just to get the body used to playing in pads and there's a short window to get ready for the opener. Um, when the pat when the when the hitting really starts like it did on Friday is when you kind of try to see what the separation is. And Malik Jackson looked fantastic in that setting on Friday. I mean, he's looked pretty good all week. He's a long, lean athlete. Uh, I think the best thing he said to, when he talked to us was that uh, he's a team player and he'll go outside on the end if that's what Schwartz wants him to do. He had always kind of resisted um, moving to the outside. Even though he's got the build to go play outside, he's kind of resisted it for whatever reason. He, he considers himself a tackle first. But, you know, Schwartz wants to move him out there and Schwartz is going to move him out there. He's going to get these three tackles that you mentioned on the field at the same time, Cox, Hargrave, and, and Jackson. Uh, and Jackson's the most likely candidate to go outside. Um, he's going to get some time outside, and I, and I think he can be very effective out there. Um, maybe the concern going outside is to stop the run, to set the edge against the run. So I don't think you'd throw him out there in a running down if it's a third and long. Yeah, yeah I was going to ask, you, you think like the NASCAR packages, you could see him yeah. kicked outside and then Graham Absolutely. inside? Yeah. Oh, Absolutely. That? Like and then we talk about interchangeable parts, Connor, with, um, you know, the secondary and, and some of these pieces. You have that on the defensive line, too. You know, Curry and even Brandon Graham, they can move inside at tackle. That's where Graham oh, yeah. made the iconic play in the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Sacking Tom Brady was as a tackle. So, you know, these guys can move inside, outside. Hargrave, I think, stays inside. Cox stays inside. There was a time when I thought Cox would be great on the outside, but they love him inside, and there's no reason not to. But those other guys – uh, they can go outside. And you mentioned Hassan Ridgeway. He he looked really good Friday. I mean, he he was really coming on last year. Took him a couple games to oh, find I thought so, too. Game. I thought so, too. He's young, too. He's a young player. Yeah. I just think he was bouncing around the Colts and then the, I think another – it might have been the Raiders or something like that. But uh, the systems just weren't fitting him. His, his, no. his skill set that he comes here to this system, and it, it highlights his interior pass rush moves perfectly. I thought he was doing fine. Then he got hurt. Obviously, yep. Dallas. So – uh, I thought bringing him back was huge. And not only that, when you you most likely, unfortunately, have to probably move off of Malik Jackson next year due to his contract. Hassan Ridge is right there to be the third defensive tackle. They bring him back, which I would, because he's still super young. I think he's only, what, 25? So, I mean, that yeah. I, I like that. I like I love that group. Uh, so the NASCAR package I'm thinking of is kick Malik Jackson outside, because you mm-hmm. mentioned back when Malik Jackson was with Denver, he was playing the 3-4 defensive end position, so he had to go up against uh, the – the inside of an offensive tackle already kick him out outside of NASCAR packages, put Graham inside Cox inside, and then put Josh sweat on the other, on the other side. Mm-hmm. I like it. I like it. That's a lot of speed. That's a lot of speed. It's a lot of the bodies they eat right there. Yeah. Uh, I, and, we, and we haven't even talked about, and this is a problem for the Eagles. You know, you mentioned Jackson's contract up. I mean, but you got guys like Anthony rush, uh, who I think has looked good this week. I also cool. liked, um, they're undrafted free agent, Raekwon Williams. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, he's a big, lean guy, too. I mean, these, these two guys, I'm not sure they're going to make the team. They're probably going to try to get into the roster or the practice squad. Um, but, you know, if I'm an, another NFL team, you know, I mean, Anthony Rush, we saw he, he was picked up by the Raiders after the Eagles cut him, and he was on their practice squad when the Eagles grabbed him back late in the year. But, you know, these are two guys that can play, and, I just don't think there's going to be enough room on the roster for them or enough snaps if they do make the roster somehow. Oh, yeah, no. Uh, Raycon Williams, I liked a lot of Michigan yeah. State, so I would I would hope that they could at least try to keep him on the practice squad because, uh, yeah, there's no, I, I, I don't think there's a way that they can keep more than four defensive tackles this year no. uh, considering what they're going to have to do at defensive end because Avery's probably going to have to make the team. Uh, Shreef Miller's probably going to have to make the team because they invested that fourth and in, then Sweat, Barnett, Curry. That's already five right there, and then – you're, you told me when we were off air that Joe Austin's looking great so yeah. far. So, so, I mean, he's making his case. Uh, I had NBC Sports draft analyst Thorne Eichstrom on the last show, and he told me Casey Tufo is a perfect fit for the Eagles system, that they could really utilize his skill set better than uh, Sanford did. So that's probably why that he's better than where he was drafted at. So uh, yeah. Tuhill is very probably be the practice squad, I'm sure. But, I mean. Yeah, he's he's quick. He's athletic. He doesn't have the, the functional strength to kind of bull rush anybody. So he's kind of at this point, right. I think, more of a, a one trick pony type of guy. Mm-hmm. Um, he can shut down that speed rush around the outside and some tackles can't. Um, and we've seen some Eagles in camp have a little bit of trouble with that. Exactly. But if you can shut that down, then, you know, he's not he doesn't have a real big repertoire of moves yet. Um, right. 
He's he, a project for sure, but yeah, yeah, I mean, you could he'd be more effective, kind of like in a Joker role, maybe moving him in and out and playing him at you know stand up linebacker spot. But um, that might be for down the road. Right now, as a rookie, I don't. I mean, he's, right, no, I, he's not making the team. team. Yeah. But Joe Osman, I mean, he's been a training camp period the last couple of times, so hopefully he doesn't tear his ACL because, I mean, if he doesn't, they might have a tough decision to make with Shreve, Hill, Shreve Miller and Jannard Avery. And then uh, you also told me off air, Jannard Avery is not really impressing or turning just, head. I mean, I've seen Prince Tega Wanagahu, the rookie tackle, and one-on-one drills just kind of eat Avery up, just kind of flick him away like, you know, he's a bug on the windshield or something. I mean, he's very small. Um, he is strong, no question about it. He's got a good lower body. But, you know, Prince Tegan Wanaga, who's a, a rookie tackle, um, who had some knee issues coming uh, into the draft. And, mm-hmm. you know, twice he was able to just eat Avery up on, on the one-on-one pass rushes. So, you know, that's a that's a third-team tackle against the guy that you're kind of counting on to be your D end. I mean, I know you traded a fourth for him, and he's probably going to make the team because of that. But uh, to me, again, maybe he's more effective in a joker role. Maybe Schwartz kind yeah, of finds things so. for him up and down that line. Um, but right now, he, to me, looks just kind of like, again, just like a one-trick speed guy to the outside. Yeah, so maybe Joe Osman does push him for the roster spot. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, sucks with no preseason, though. That's just uh, I, I, As a person, I, I mean, I always said cut down the preseason games to just two games. I've never been a huge preseason fan, but I mean – I never mm-hmm. said get rid of it because you need it for evaluations. Uh, I don't know if you're watching Hard Knocks, but uh, Anthony Lynn and uh, Tom Telesco were talking. They're like, if we didn't have preseason, we wouldn't even know who Austin Eckler was. So uh, mm-hmm. I think I think preseason is a huge thing. So it's tough to not because now maybe they think, well, we traded a fourth for Gennard Avery. Joe Austin looks good in practice, but we traded a fourth for Gennard Avery. Whereas you have these preseason games go off of Gennard Avery looks bad in the preseason. Joe Austin looks good. Now you're probably feeling like we should go with Joe Osman. You don't have that this year. So mm-hmm. uh, I think that's a little tough. Uh, I hope they don't really choose draft status when uh, making these roster decisions because I think they're going to miss out on some good guys. That's why if we were ha- if we had this different conversation where J.J. Arcega-Whiteside came back and he hasn't been looking good or he hasn't been making these catches, I was going to ask you, do you think that maybe this is another Eric Rowe type situation where the late-round guys are impressing enough to push the second-round guy off the roster who – doesn't have the guy who really drafted him around anymore. But now with him looking good, no preseason, I doubt that theory ever comes to fruition. I feel like the Eagles have to keep J.J. Ortega Whiteside at this point now, just with yeah. everything. Look, every, with all, I mean, no preseason really hurts. What I, I think it hurts every team, though. So it's not just the Eagles. But, man, I just can't imagine how they make these roster evaluations with just going off of practice. That's tough. tough. But then yeah. we've seen preseason, you know, superstar players like, Remember Henry Josie, the running back from a few years ago, looked like looked dynamite as a running back, and you know he never really panned out. And um, there were a couple other ones. There was a receiver whose name was Bailey. Yeah, Rashad Bailey. They everybody loved him in Philadelphia. Paul Turner. We all love those guys. Yeah, all these guys they shine during preseason, but there's just something missing that we're not seeing. We just see them in in the games, and then when they put the coaches tape on, that is a good point. Bit of different story. So yeah, you can really separate guys like that as well guys that look great in practice and and camp and then when the lights go on they just don't kind of shine as bright as they do during practice so yeah it's a it's a real tough balancing act but again like i said earlier you know there's 31 other teams that don't have preseason games either so there's going to be guys across the league and i think i think you might see the eagles a little bit more active in the past at the waiver wire 
uh, at some of these positions, maybe at like a linebacker or running back even um, once teams start to cut players. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like they have to, the Hassan Reddick thing, your theory last episode, I thought was just going to too good to be true. I feel like that's something they actually really explore uh, Temple kid. And then he played the safety linebacker hybrid role at Temple. I think that's something the Eagles actually literally legitimately explore, but the Ravens are also stacked at linebacker. LJ wow. Fort mistake might be able to be righted uh, if they get rid of him. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of, there's going to be some linebacker town out there. So I think the Eagles will, I had the, they had no choice. They haven't replaced Jatavius Brown. So I feel like they're going to have to be looking for linebacker town eventually, but uh, yeah. moving on. Cause I want to get into this real quick. We, I, we all know by now, Matt Pryor at some point in the season is going to play. Jason Peters is going to miss some snaps or he's going to miss a game. What have you thought so far about Matt Pryor looking in camp? Because I know we talked off air about Jason Peters, which is what I want to get into after. But what do you think about Matt Pryor? Yeah, um, too soon to tell, too I soon. think, at this point. Yeah, I think he looked um, – I thought he looked okay in the scrimmage. I mean, I, he didn't do anything really that uh, stood out bad. Um, so, you know, I think that he's probably an adequate guy to throw in there. I think the experience he got last year will help. Um, but the offensive line, that whole Jason Peters experiment to me is, is really, I'm calling that into question big time right now. And so you're going to need Matt Pryor to kind of figure it out quickly. And I think, I think so far he's probably on track to doing that. I would say, um, again, I haven't noticed, I didn't notice him too much on Friday, uh, he played a lot. He was in there with the third team line, the second team line, the first team line. I mean, he got a lot of reps. So they're getting him ready because I think the Eagles kind of know that, yeah, Peters, he's not going to play all 16. He's not going to play 100% of the snaps. There's going to be times he's going to miss, and they need to have Matt Pryor ready. So getting into Jason Peters, I've always was one that said, do not play him at guard. Uh, I thought that was a horrible decision. I mean, at this, he's a statue. I just think you have to be so much fluid and be able to move so well at guard, and that's just not going to be Jason Peters. I think the false starts are even going to be amplified at guard this year, even more because that cadence from a guard to a tackle is just so different. I, I'm just – I'm not feeling it either, Ed, and I, I, I'm – it's, I feel like, of course, it's going to show the first week of training camp because obviously it's a new position. So I think a lot of people are going to hear that and take it with a grain of salt and use context with it a little bit. But to me, I just thought, you know, you bring Peters back just in case if Dillard doesn't look the part. Uh, but, I mean, we all know that the Eagles are going to play Jason Peters no matter what. So going into week one, I feel like he's going to be the right guard no matter what. But uh, it's not looking good for you so far, apparently. Uh, well, I don't think he looked particularly good Friday. Um, but again, one week you expect yeah, a guy to play left tackle his whole life to all of a sudden the light bulb to go on. But that's kind of what the Eagles are expecting. And, you know, we have a short amount of time here for that light bulb to go on. And uh, one of the big adjustments with playing inside is, and, in, you know, interior linemen have told me this, it's like playing in a phone booth. You know, there's so much traffic inside and you're in such – close quarters with everyone around you as opposed to being out at Taka where Peters is used to just being on the island and having all this space to work with and to move laterally and to drop. You know, he's not going to have that. He's going to get a lot of bull rushes. Um, there was a play in the scrimmage on, uh, I told you this off air, uh, on Friday uh, with the offense coming off the goal line uh, as one of the drills. And he and it was Fletcher Cox. So, you know, Cox is tremendous, of course. But you know, pushing Peters just kind of right back into Wentz's lap. And I don't know if there would have been a sack during the game, but Wentz was able to spin out, roll, and threw a deep pass down to John Hightower for a completion uh, up near midfield from his own end zone, which was a nice play. But, you know, I was kind of watching that matchup with my binoculars with Peters and, and Cox, and, you know, Cox really got the better of him. And then you look at who there's on their schedule. Like, you you know, you mentioned Geno Atkins with the Bengals and, you know, Aaron Donald comes in here week two. I mean, these guys are going to – if I'm a defensive coordinator, I'm testing Peters from the get-go with whatever I can, try to confuse him, try to get him to come off of the, pl the player he's supposed to block because the communication isn't there. I mean, this has a chance to really uh, put Carson Wentz's season in jeopardy, if you ask me. I hate to say it, but uh, it's a big adjustment. Peters isn't used to it. He hasn't had the offseason work on the field, and – uh, to me, it, it's something that could really blow up in their face early on. 
I think so too. I just don't think it's gonna work out. That's why. I mean, at least they're preparing Matt Pryor, though. Yeah, yeah. I have to tip my hat. I have to tip my hat for that because they're not. It doesn't sound like they're putting all their eggs in the Jason Peters basket. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I I was not a I, I was a fan of bringing Jason Peters back because I didn't think Andre Diller would be ready to play left tackle. That was my whole point of bringing Jason Peters back. But uh, to play right guard, I just don't think it's gonna work. I and which is such a shame yeah. if it doesn't because that's. This is the what we're going to end our Jason Peters memory on is him switching his position and just being an absolute failure at it. Possibly, I that mm. that would just be such a horrible way to go out. I mean, if Andre Diller starts struggling, I hope they they move Peters left tackle right away because I thought Peters played well at left tackle last year. I agree with you. The transition is just too big. I don't think yeah. I think people think it's just so easy to for an offensive lineman just to move inside. I don't think that, especially when you're talking about a guy who's as slow and. He's gone through all these Achilles injuries and uh, misses a bunch of snaps. This guy's a statue. I think the best spot for him is a tackle. I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm struggling to think that it's a good idea either. But you also mentioned off air that they're working Carson Wentz a lot out of the pocket with rollouts and stuff. I think that's major, majorly important because this offensive line is not going to be what it was years prior. Yeah, and, you know, Carson's always thrown the ball well when he's been able to move. You know, he's Absolutely. just – quarterback when he's on the move um remember that throw last year i think it was in, against washington the miles sanders in the back of the end zone oh, yep I mean, carson was rolling out then he was able he's able to plant his feet and he zipped that ball right in there so you know we've seen him make some nice plays on the move and i think that's the product of bringing in um rich scangarello um to kind of get some fresh eyes on the offense and the personnel uh as well as marty morningweg uh who's been at it a long time uh, running offenses. So, you know, I think that's the effect of these two new guys. I think we're going to see uh, Wentz moving out a little bit more. You see even during, you know, the team por- or the uh, individual portions of practice during the week, the quarterbacks working on their footwork, uh, I think a little bit more regularly, you know, just kind of bouncing forward, bouncing front, side to side. Um, so I see, you see more of them working on their footwork. And I think you're going to see a little bit more designed um, rollouts left and right. And, and Carson, I think, can throw it on the move no matter which way he's rolling out. I mean, he's got right. that ability and that kind of a mecha- um, mechanical skill set to be able to make the, every throw you can going left or right. Right, and he's been one of the best, uh, statistic-wise, he's been one of the best passers out of the pocket in the NFL since he's entered the league. So yeah. I, I agree with you completely. And most of it, most of his highlights from 2017 are throws he's made out of the pocket as well. I mean, that first game against Washington, he he rolled out of the pocket, found Aguilar deep. Uh, that Right. was getting out of the pocket, so I agree with you. But uh, the last thing on Peters, he also plays Jonathan Allen week one. So that's the first test right away, right off the bat, that I think it's going to be a tough challenge for him. Uh, and, and not just physically, again, but mentally, you know. that you know, It's just too different, yeah. It's just too different. Hunting, you know, it's going to – usually when you're on that tackle, you know who's across from you. That's the guy. That's not always the case on the interior. You have a guy lined up for you who might take two steps back and a guy comes stunting in from another direction, and you have to know, you know, where that pressure is coming from. So that whole communication, and Kelsey's great at being able to communicate the line calls, but now it's up to Jason to kind of execute that line call. He could know what it is, but if he doesn't put that two and two together, there's going to be problems. And it's a shame that he didn't have that offseason that – you know, right. normally seen because I think it really would have been benefited him, obviously. And we wouldn't have these concerns here at the end of August uh, had, the, you know, they worked out in May and early June. Um, but again, we don't have that. And that that could, again, like I said, blow up right in the Eagles face. Huh. I hope not. But Jalen Hurts, I saw that. Yeah, I hate to be a downer on that, but that's just no, kind of how I, I kind of. I envisioned it. So honestly, yeah. you're just kind of saying stuff I expected already. Honestly, I got killed for tweeting it too. I, I when, it, when the theory was resigned when Brandon Brooks went down, I feel like the first theory was bring Jason Peters back to play guard anyways before the Eagles even made the move. And I was like, don't do that. Do not play Jason Peters at guard. He can he cannot play guard, and they're doing it. So uh, we'll see. But I don't, I'm not a I'm not a big fan of either. But one person I want to hit on real quick, Jalen Hurts. That's when because you're talking about the footwork, so that's what really reminded me to ask about him. But that footwork video, his footwork is amazing. He, you could just tell, I don't because you, uh, you said it before, he is like a physical type runner. He looks like where McNabb was in the early 2000s when he would run. He looks like that kind of runner. Uh, this footwork looks amazing, and now everybody's talking like he should be quarterback too. 
Uh, I believe if Carson Wentz goes down for a long period of time, then you start having that conversation. If it's a week-to-week injury, Carson, then I feel like you need to go Sudfeld. But what, where are you on Jalen Hurts hype right now? Because this gets that train is rolling, my friend. It is. <laughs> yeah, I like I like Jalen Hurts a lot. I mean, we've seen him in red zone packages. He he's very uh, shifty, very elusive. You know, you mentioned McNabb. Um, you know, I look out on the field and you know I see kind of like a like a Russell Wilson type. I mean, he's a little taller than Russell Wilson, but just the way he's built. Um, but I even think Hurts is built better. I mean, he looks strong. I mean. He looks very cerebral. It doesn't look like there's anything that bothers him. Um, he's always paying attention, uh, even when he's off to the side. And he doesn't always get a lot of reps. Um, obviously, it'll go Wentz, Sudfeld, then back to Wentz sometimes, and then they'll throw Hurts out there for maybe one, two, or three reps. So he's not getting all those reps. But there are times when he does get them, and you can see that he's capable of making plays with his feet. He's very good at play action. Um, but he's going to be the kind of quarterback I think that there will be some plays for him during the course of a game this year. And I don't think they're just going to be necessarily running plays. I think the Eagles will have enough confidence in him to keep defenses honest, not just play the run when he comes into the game, because he can throw the ball too. Uh, He's made a couple bad throws. I mean, it's not been, you know, a hundred percent perfect for him, but again, rookie guy, uh, I know all his teammates. Yeah. I mean, he, he's going to grow. Uh, exponentially, I think. And again, not having the off season that we're typically used to having uh, brings him back a little bit. But um, he's a mature guy. He's played in two huge college football programs, you know, factories in Alabama and Oklahoma. Um, so I don't think there's any situation that's too big for him. Uh, I really like what I've seen. And like you said, if Wentz gets hurt, for a couple of weeks, it's probably going to be Sudfield. I mean, Sudfield had a really good scrimmage on Friday, I will say. I mean, he made some mistakes, but I thought it was his best practice day of the week, to be honest. He still, to me, holds the ball a little bit too long um, and leads to coverage sacks or whatever it is, and he'll have to eat the ball or, or make a play that he shouldn't make and throw it up for grabs. Um, and we know what Sudfeld is. Hurts still the ceiling is the limit, and that's what makes it exciting is to see – you know, him get closer and closer to that ceiling, which I don't know when we're going to see him get to that ceiling. It could be a couple of years. Um, but so far, he looks fantastic to me. Uh, for a rookie, no off season, for the situation he's in with limited reps, I think he looks as good as he can look. That's, I mean, first week of camp and you're coming away that impressed with him. That's that's very good. That's a very good indication of what he, the talent that he is. I've, I'm excited to hear more about him coming into this next week now. And then last, I want to end on before we get to these questions that we got. Sean Bradley gets like a tweet a day, a positive tweet a day. Everybody keeps talking about him. Uh, yeah. Should we start Should we start paying attention to Sean Bradley? Could he make some noise starting a linebacker? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's going to be on special teams. Uh, he's got the speed, right. the quickness. He's got the moxie. He looks like he belongs. He's knocking guys down to the point where, uh, you know, Ken Flajol, the position coach, talked to us uh, Friday uh, about having to kind of put a governor on that, you know, when you have an engine that races too fast, you have to put a governor on it right. to down a little bit. You know, you want to be smart with the with the shots you're taking against your own team. You want to keep guys healthy and safe. So uh, I think they love his enthusiasm, but they want him to dial, dial it back a little bit uh, and, and uh, limit his aggressiveness. But, yeah, he looks really fast. Now, yesterday in the scrimmage, we saw him kind of whiff on an open field tackle on a short throw to Holyfield. Holyfield made a great move. I mentioned earlier, I really – like what I've seen from Elijah Holyfield. The knock on him has always been his speed, um, but he looks awfully fast to me. He gets to the edge quick, and yesterday he put a move on uh, on Bradley uh, in open space, short catch turns, and Bradley went running by him because Holyfield stopped on a dime and then cut inside and went for a long gain. Uh, but then later in the same series, Bradley came back, same throw to the other side of the field. He closed in a, in a hurry on Holyfield and buried him after like a two. Uh, I like that. Short memory. Yeah. Sure, yep, remember yep. that. That sounds like that kind of player that I want to root for. All yep. right, I, I really like what I've seen from Shrubber, and the, the, the tweets, the daily tweets are deserving. The guys look really good. Awesome. And then, I mean, I mean, has TJ Edwards kind of like jumped out at you at all? TJ Edwards, yeah, yeah. Oh, TJ Edwards, good. He's a good player, man. He had a nice tip pass of a Jalen Hurts throw yesterday. Very active. Um, yeah, I like Edwards a lot too, and so does Ken Flajol. Flajol really likes him. Smart guy. Second year in the system. 
He's not. He's an undrafted free agent. Again, guys come in the NFL. He's an undrafted guy. He's probably thinking, why didn't I get picked? Am I deserving to be here? Um, but this year he certainly feels like he belongs, and I, and I think he'll have a nice year. That's important because he's probably going to start at this point. Um, but, I mean, yeah. I like hearing Sean Bradley making some noise. Uh, yeah, they Temple need great, Yeah, Temple guy. But plus, they need an unexpected contribution at linebacker no matter what. So I, I, if it, whether it be Sean Bradley, whether it be TJ Edwards, whether it be Duke Riley, cause I don't think it's going to be Davion Taylor at rookie year, but yeah. it's gotta be one of those guys. At least it has to be. So let's roll into some of these questions real quick. So we can wrap this up. Uh, we got a question about on Twitter from at gloomy Smitty in his question was biggest winner and loser of the week. Biggest winner of the week is probably Sean Bradley, guy we just talked about. To me, really stood out. Rookie guy, came out, looked like he belonged. Um, and, of course, you throw Jalen Rager in there, too. I mean, listen, we could talk about this draft class to me. Top to bottom looks really, really good. I mean, good. I know a weekend things could happen. But to me right now, this draft class looks you – know, pick 10 guys. And, I think that's uh, important because, I, I mean, these guys have such an unorthodox rookie OTAs as is. So – uh, to come in and hit your strides right away and to already get your notice to feel that way. I think that's important. I know it's the first week, but I take that more with uh, take that more into consideration when talking about them. Yep. So Bradley, I'll go Bradley and I'll go Rager, my two big uh, winners of the week, my losers. Um, I would probably go Sidney Jones, who for some reason didn't dress on Friday for the scrimmage. Uh, hasn't looked terribly good in some one-on-one drills that I've seen him in. Uh, and then Jordan Mulata, uh, the tackle who, you know, I know he was a project coming in as a seventh round pick in 2017, I think it was, or maybe I think it was 2018. Um, yeah. yeah, it was 2018. He wasn't on the Super Bowl team. So, you know, the deck, the deck was stacked against him from the get go. And I just, you know, I've seen him get beat too often. Joe Ostman eats him for lunch. Um, I, he just didn't have a good week. So I'd say Mulata and Jones were probably my two biggest losers of the week. And I hate to use the word loser, but disappointment, maybe. Yeah, disappointment. I'll, I'll, yeah, I like it. So next question is from Dakota Prasher. He asked, how has Josh Sweat looked overall? Great. That's one word great. answer, great. Yeah, that's, that's, that, no, that's a good answer because we all need yeah. him to look great. So I, I'll Eat take that. Well. Fast, great, fast. You know, a lot of adjectives you can throw that way. But uh, – he beat Dillard, Andre Dillard, during the scrimmage yesterday with a really nice speed move to the inside that Dillard was just too slow to react to, and Sweat was all of a sudden in the backfield. So, again, a guy that played some snaps last year, had four sacks uh, in limited snaps last year. I see him probably taking a big step this year, and like you said, Connor, the Eagles really need him to have that big step. Absolutely. Next question is from at Steve O'Hara 7. Ed, do you think Quez and Hightower both make the team? I think Hightower does. Um, yeah, we Quez, I'm, I'm not so sure of, and it's just probably a numbers game at that point. I think he's got the ability to make a team. You hope you can get him through waivers to get him to the practice squad. Um, and, again, not having the preseason, some of these players, there's no film on them. So teams aren't really going to know about other players that are rookies that they only have college tape on. Um, but just the numbers situation, I think Hightower's looked very good. Running routes, uh, showed some nice things in route running. He can catch the ball. I think he had maybe a drop on Monday, but I haven't seen him drop hardly anything at all since. Nothing, really. So I like Hightower. I think he makes it. Watkins, I think, is a little bit more of, of a project. And um, ha- if the Eagles could keep 55 guys on the roster or 56, then he would probably be one of them. But I just think a numbers game with Watkins, and they'll probably hope to get him to the practice squad. Yeah, I would, I would. That's why I originally thought, but then you hear this connection with Wentz and him since Houston has been yeah. live. So uh, yeah. you had to see. But I was really high on John Hightower coming out, though. I thought he would in any other class. He's a third round pick. I compared yeah. him to John Brown. Uh, I know Jimmy Kensky compared him to Steve Breston, who I thought is a great comparison too. So I'm all in on the Jai Hightower train. I like that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the next question is from Nonchalante Bari Jabari. Uh, I think I said his yeah Nonchalant Bari on Twitter. Is there a noticeable difference with JJ this year in camp as opposed to last year's camp? I'm sorry, between who? Uh, JJ Arcega Whiteside. Is there a noticeable difference from last year's camp to this year's camp? Uh, yeah, I, I would, I would say so. I, I, I don't really, you know, he looked okay in camp last year. 
I would say. I mean, I don't think it was until really the game started and, and we saw that he just wasn't ready. I mm-hmm. think he had one good preseason game last year. Right. Uh, with a lot high volume catches, big yard yardage total. Um, so I, I think we were pretty high on on JJ last year based on his camp, if I remember right. And this year, um, like we talked about earlier, he does look a little bit lighter. He does look more confident. He, he, I think he's able to play a little bit faster now because he knows where he's supposed to go on every single play. Um, so I would say that he does look better, but I don't know if it's noticeable from last year because I thought last year he looked pretty good too. Um, right. And you hope he's not one of those guys that looks good in practice, and then when the lights go on, he just kind of disappears. You wouldn't think he's that kind of player coming from the Pac-12 and Stanford that's played in a lot of big games, but um, we're going to have to wait and see on J.J. once the season begins. But right now, all signs are promising, and he does look good in camp, maybe slightly better than last year. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's a good answer for me. All right, so the next question is at jhern 0 His question is – John Hernandez, by the way, I should say the people's names. Uh, Rieger, Djax, and Greg Ward starting the season, or does JJ take Rieger's spot? Uh, that's, that's a very. It, I'm about to say that's a that, that's a that's not really a first week answer type <laughs> to, to answer yeah. the question. I'll, I'll being, it doesn't matter who starts; it's who finishes, right. and uh, you know who plays the most snaps. I mean, I could see JJ starting. Um, but I think Rager could play more snaps when all is said and done through a game um, because Rager's look that good. I mean, and you just get the ball in space. You just get the ball in his hands in space, and he can he can really lean and make cuts, and um, he, he does he, – he looks tremendous. And um, J.J. brings a different skill set. So it could be matchup-based, who they're playing each week, what the cornerback and secondary situation looks like or the linebacker situation. If you like uh, J.J., uh, matchup wise against some of those guys, you might see him a little bit more than Rager. Maybe early on, you see JJ play a little bit more until Rager kind of gets his NFL legs under him. But um, I think initially it'll probably be JJ that gets the reps as a starter. Um, but again, it doesn't matter who starts at two yeah. plays, who snaps in that game and who finishes. Right. Cause there was games where JJ started, but Robert Davis and Dante Burnett played more snaps than them. So yeah, I, I, I think that's the same situation here as well. Um, last question, which I had to do research on this because a couple people asked this stuff and I, I never heard this report until I found it. So the question is from Dominic Virgil, D Fabrizio 88. His question is with an early return expected for Alshon, should we expect Alshon to reclaim the X receiver role? and possibly moving Rager to the slot. Now, this is all wide receivers starting questions again. Um, to go into this, I don't know where – I. from what you said, from what I've heard from the team, nobody expects him to be back in September, Alshon that is. So I, I don't know where this came from. And then I, I found out it was Adam Kaplan on Inside the Birds who said it's possible that this team expects them to be back in September, which I don't think is correct. I, I, I just don't see that they push – Alshon Jeffrey off a list Frank injury, uh, considering all the injuries he's gone through over the age of thirty to co- to come back in September off this injury. I don't. I just don't know about it. So the, uh, this question was kind of weird to me because I'm not really buying this report personally. I don't think that's not true. I just think they're hoping for the best, but I would expect yeah. the worst in this situation. I don't think Alshon plays till, till December, to be honest with you. Uh, but what the question was. Let's just let's we'll phrase the question this way because I think this is just complete Adam Kaplan throwing something against the wall. To be honest with you, uh, Kaplan has sources, so we all know he would know something maybe. But I I think this is something that's being thrown against the wall because a lot of people are talking about it lately. But let's let's phrase the question as when Alshon comes back, should we expect him to reclaim the X receiver spot? Uh, yeah. I would say yes. I think the Eagles will try to get their money's worth out of Alshon. Uh, I think it'll be a short leash. Again, the starting wide receiver spot. Yeah, I can see them running them out there, you know, after the opening kickoff if you take the field as an offense. But how many snaps he plays? Do they take it slow with him? Do they uh, use him just up just in matchup situations? Uh, remains to be seen. You know, he's 30 years old, coming off of the injury. Um, what does he have left? He kind of looked a little bit sluggish last year. Um, but yeah, I could see them doing that. He's a veteran. You throw him out there to start the game, but then as the game wears on, you, you know, he's sitting on the bench and you just hope that he's not causing trouble, um, because of that situation. Uh, I was really about to say, to- oh man, I don't think that's going to be sit well with him. If he thinks nah. he's back fully healthy and the Eagles are 
playing him on a snap count. Yeah. I will say this about Alshon and his health. He's been playing a lot of catch off on one of the side fields, and uh, I've been watching some of those catch. He's not really fully extending himself. He's kind of catching things within his radius. He's not running to catch a ball. He's not running any patterns. He, he's not really bending over low to right. catch the low ones. Or- That's why I don't get this report. That's September's next month. Like, if he's not even doing any of that stuff, like, he's not coming back. I don't, I don't know where I, – I I had to search because – I we are, we gotta ask because I posted this on Facebook too, and for some reason that's like the big talk on the Facebook groups. Is Adam Kaplan said on the podcast that they're they're hopeful and that there's some hope in the building that Alshon's back in September, and I'm like, mm, that goes against everything I've heard. I go literally, I've not heard one person ever say anything about Alshon being back September. Everything I've heard is December. Yeah, well, so I know that's I- interesting that he feels that way. Yeah, Doug's on record, too, as saying that this is going to be a veteran-led team early on. And, you know, maybe that's where that hope comes from, is Alshon's definitely a veteran. And if he's not available, uh, then you have Hightower and Rager that you're going to be counting on. But, you know, if he's available week one and he's on the roster, I mean, now you're looking at uh, Jackson, Jeffrey, Ward, J.J. as four of your receivers. Rager will be the fifth. So where does that leave, you know, Hightower? You know, you're keeping six guys. Um, so that that's an issue in itself. I guess you would keep six at that point and go short. Yeah. Else, maybe three running backs only um, with Clement, Sanders, and Scott. Um, but that remains to be seen. Uh, I just, based on what I've seen from Alshon just in the week of practice, it just doesn't look like he's near 100% yet. I mean, yeah, he's catching passes, but he's not really running patterns. Uh, he's not really running at all much that I can see. So, you know, that, that to me, I think September 13th would be a stretch to have him back on the field. Maybe they're hoping for September 27th when I think it's the Bengals they play week three. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Uh, because if not, then you have to put him on IR and then you won't see him for six weeks. I think that's, at this stage, the most likely case. Well, I agree with that completely. I think so, too. Uh, but, but, I mean, that is actually a good thing. I mean, we'll talk about this in, in months leading up to his return. But that's a good theory that you put out there. When they do bring him back, I wouldn't expect them to him be to be a full starting wide receiver. I wouldn't expect them to play every snap on the offense. How does that sit with him? How does that play out in the locker room? How does it play out on the sidelines? Because if anything that the, from 2018 season shown, from the 2019 season shown, if it doesn't go Alshon's way, Josina will hear about it. So uh, <laughs> that's that's a little interesting to me. I, some people are still trying to figure out if it was him or not. I I I. I moved on from that theory. I think it's, I think it's clearly Alshon Jeffrey, but uh, it looks like he's still trying to, I mean, from, from my perspective, again, I'm sitting at home and watching from the outside looking in. It looks like he's, he is trying to buy his way back into the team though. Uh, all, all the young receivers, uh, Hightower and Watkins and uh, Rager, they mention Alshon as someone that really is helping them. They mentioned Deshaun and Alshon. It's not just Deshaun. Um, they always put Alshon in there too. So, you know, behind the scenes, it looks like he is trying to help them learn to, to take his job someday. And maybe that someday is sooner rather than later. And like you said, right. we'll see how it sits with him. Right. I mean, you have some people, it's it's diverse on Twitter. Some people on Eagles Twitter think Alshon's going to come back and be good. Some people don't expect to come back. or And then some people expect to come back and just not be that great. And that's probably where I'm at. Uh, I just think I thank him for everything. Without him, there's no Lombardi in Philadelphia. I just think now he's doing, he's on the downward trajectory of his career. I don't yeah. think there's going to be any surge or anything coming back from that. Uh, but it's good to hear that he is helping out these wide receivers. So it sounds like he's being a little more team-oriented than whereas he's complaining to Josina about Earth's getting targeted and uh, how he's not trading for Jalen Ramsey type of stuff. So yeah. uh, glad to hear that. Uh, but – that's it for us. So we'll wrap this up real quick. Again, you can find all Ed's work and also John McMullen's work on Eagles Maven of Sports Illustrated. You go on their website real quick, si.com slash Eagles. You can see all their Eagles articles. Ed's been taking notes every single day after training camp. The notes are very informative. And then you can also read them and then ask him a question on Twitter about them and he'll respond to you right away. So yeah. I'll put I'll plug in. Sensible uh, questions. <laughs> sensible questions. Yeah, of course. So I'll plug I in the URL in the detail. I love interacting with Yeah. You you do well with that a lot. Of, I mean, I 
I'm sure you get like what probably a million mentions a day. Your Twitter notifications probably go off crazy after you tweet something out. But I mean, to still go through that stuff and answer people, that respect for that, my friend. Yeah, it's a lot of work. It's a lot I'm of trying. work. But sometimes it's hard to go through them all, you know. And I'm trying to watch practice, and I'll I'll glance at the tweets occasionally. Right, but I like and you got right. Yeah, and thanks for mentioning John McMullen, man. He does a great job. Uh, my colleague. He does, yes. Well, we got to support the whole entire Sports Illustrated Eagles page now. You're our Eagles insider. I appreciate that. Thank you. But he does he does do some great work as well. So yeah. you guys can go check out those articles. Uh, if you didn't hear anything in the episode today, I promise you.